So before anyone else asks me, no, I don't have your midterms graded yet. There's like 65 of them, so it takes, it takes me a while to grade them. Um, I'll try and have them by next week. Um, and just a quick note on that, I do not give back the exams. Um, I give, the way I give back the marks, you have a fairly detailed grade, so you'll get back what you got on each question. And then after I get it back, I'll like remind you in the beginning of next class what each question was, so you can see that. And of course, you're always free to come see your exam um, in my office during the office hour to go over any of the answers. But I just don't want, if I give back the exams, then the next class has the exams. This, that's why you like, that's why people want them back, is, is to give them to their friends in the next year. So uh, you can come see them. I'll be happy to talk with them, talk with anyone at length about uh, how they did on the exam, but I just don't give the physical paper back um, after the exam is written. So we can see by the schedule today, um, we had the midterm last class. And today, we're going to be talking about uh, evolutionary computing or evolutionary algorithms. And uh, that will be the subject of assignment four, which I'll release in the next class. So five days from now, we're handing out assignment four, and assignment three will be due, standard um, scheduling stuff for the class. So let's just hop into it. If PowerPoint, what's going on? Don't you do this. What is going on? I literally have no problems with this all day until, and it's only this room that there's ever problems. Look, it has to do with the video out. Weird, only this room. Okay, so lecture number 11. We're doing an introduction. Sorry, guys. Can we stop talking loudly now, please? Thanks. Um, so an introduction to evolutionary computing um, and evolutionary algorithms. Um, so just a quick, uh, a quick note. There is some biology in this lecture. Um, I will make this uh, warning again when I get to that part. I am not a biologist. And you will not have to know any of the biology on an exam. But evolutionary computing is very heavily inspired by the natural phenomenon of evolution. And so I just want to give those analogies to real biology in order to show you the motivation for why these algorithms exist. But it's not necessary that you retain that information for the purposes of an exam, but it's nice to let you know why, um, why I'm giving that. So what is uh, evolutionary computation? So wherever I say EC or EA, um, in the slides, it's going to be referring to that, just to, to, to be a bit shorter. So the positioning of EC. EC is a part of computer science and algorithms. Um, it is not necessarily a part of life sciences or biology. So if you take a degree in biology or life sciences, you probably won't have to implement a genetic algorithm. Like, it is a computer science algorithm that has its inspirational roots in the biological sciences. So biology um, delivers the inspiration and the terminology that's used to create these algorithms, but the algorithms themselves are just, you know, just like any other algorithm, and they're not that hard to, to implement. So evolutionary computation can be applied in biological research, but it has many, many possible applications, right? It can be on a problem that has absolutely nothing to do with biology, and in assignment three, we'll actually be uh, using an evolutionary algorithm or a specific type of evolutionary algorithm called a genetic algorithm to try and solve a Sudoku puzzle. And so Sudoku obviously has nothing to do with biology, but yeah. So just, just letting you know where this all lives in the grander scheme of, of academia. So here is the metaphor, if you will, for or analogy for evolutionary computation. So over here, um, we have a problem solving uh, thing, like, okay, I want to solve an actual problem in the real world. And over here, we have the, <coughs> excuse me, the evolutionary um, biology equivalent of that in the problem-solving sense. So, for example, if I was talking about um, a problem that I want to solve using evolutionary computation, well, I, we know what a well-formed problem is in the context of this course, for example. In evolution, 
in natural evolution, that problem would be the environment, right? So the problem may be these uh, organisms trying to survive on top of a mountain, or maybe they're underwater, or near a volcano, or something like that. So the problem is represented by the environment. A candidate solution to a problem, so for example, if we were doing pathfinding, that would be a path through, um, a possible path through the environment, or if we were doing a Sudoku puzzle, then a candidate solution might be a placing of numbers in a Sudoku puzzle. That would be represented by an individual in a population in an evolutionary context. So I am a potential solution to the problem of life. You are a potential solution to the problem of life, right? You solve certain problems, I solve certain problems. The quality of the problem solving, um, so we've talked about things like um, performance measures, et cetera. In the evolutionary context, that is the fitness of an individual. And we'll talk a bit more about this um, in the future, but the quality in a problem-solving context, especially for evolutionary computation, would mean what is the chance that this solution is used to improve itself and make better solutions? Fitness in an environment like the real world, the real world in an evolutionary context has no function that we can apply for fitness, right? So we can't say, like, this individual is fitter than another individual. There's no function for that. You may ascribe fitness to, like, physical fitness, how much can you bench or whatever, but that's not what it means. In an evolutionary standpoint, the only measure for fitness is basically how many of a thing are there, right? So if you are evolutionarily successful, then there are more of you. There are a lot of mosquitoes. They are very evolutionary successful. The, the dodo bird was too delicious, right? And so when humans came around, it wasn't very evolutionary successful after that point. And so just how many of you is the only real world, real environment way that we can measure fitness. But when it comes to evolutionary computation, we are going to ascribe a quality of fitness to something with a formula. So for example, the fitness of a path may be how short is the path. The fitness of a Sudoku puzzle may be how close is it to being solved, right? So when we do the actual algorithm, we have to come up with a fitness. But just remember that in the real world, there is no singular fitness function that we can apply in all possible cases. And every problem that you're going to have to solve, you're going to have to encode the fitness measure somehow and that is going to be very related to the performance measure of the problem. So for example, if you're trying to minimize the path length, then your fitness will probably have something to do with path length, right? So evolutionary computation is not a recent phenomenon, right? It's kind of, so evolutionary computation, right before, let's say, <clears throat> 2011, 2012, when deep learning started to become the new hot thing, in machine learning, um, this was the new hot thing in machine learning, right? Like evolutionary computation was capable of doing things that um, machine learning was, or standard machine learning like neural networks and stuff wasn't able to do at the time. So back as far as Alan Turing um, in the 40s and 50s talked, talked about the possibility of there being a genetical or evolutionary search at some point in the history of computing. And this was like before a computer existed. That like this like man was a genius. Insane how much he he envisioned. Um, in 1962 and 19 uh, sorry 1962, um, Bremerman talked about optimization through evolution, and then evolutionary strategies came um, in 1964. Evolutionary programming in 65. Genetic algorithms, which is the algorithm we'll actually be implementing in this course. That was invented in 1975, so again, like these things are nearly 50 years old at this point. Um, and then genetic programming came out in the 90s, and of course, assignment four, right, in 2023. So let's talk a little bit about evolution and what it is. There's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, yep, yeah, go ahead. We'll talk about all that. <clears throat> Excuse me, still have a cough. All right. So Darwinian evolution, or survival of the fittest, 
What is that? Why does it relate to this course? And why is it important? So evolution, and again, I'm not a biology professor, but I'm pretty sure what I have in the slides is correct, right? So all environments in the real world have finite resources. We all need to eat. There is only so much food. That's, that's what it comes down to in the end for most cases. I want to reproduce. There are only so many possible mates. Um, I want to have shelter. There is only so much possible land. There are a finite amount of resources. Life forms have some sort of basic insect or basic instinct um, and life cycles geared toward reproduction, right? Humans nowadays, some people may want to have kids, may not want to have kids. Like the society of human beings is kind of outside the realm of evolution. We've kind of stopped evolving in this weird way, right? Like our technology gets better, but basically for all of the history of life on Earth at least, life wants to reproduce because if it doesn't reproduce, then it doesn't exist anymore, right? If nobody in the current generation reproduces, there will not be a next generation. So it's important to reproduce if you want to be successful in an environment and still exist. So therefore, if we have some desire to live and reproduce, and the amount of resources that are available to us to do that are finite, then some sort of selection is inevitable. Selection meaning some people may get to reproduce and other people may not get to reproduce. And people here means any living thing, not just humans. So the individuals that compete for resources most effectively have an increased chance of reproduction, right? So if I'm a rabbit and there's only one carrot left or whatever the stereotype is, and you're another rabbit and we fight for the carrot, whoever gets the carrot eats and probably lives, right? And evolutionarily, like, there's not many morals or feelings involved in that case, right? Like, the nicest person doesn't always get to reproduce. It's like, you know, there's a, re there's a reason that the biggest gorilla leads the pack because they just have fights, right? And that's what a lot of animals do. So there's some sort of competition that goes on. And it doesn't necessarily mean the strongest or the fastest. And we'll see an example of that later. But it just means that the individual that was most effective in that environment probably has a higher chance of reproducing. It doesn't mean that it's guaranteed. But someone who is fitter than from, for that environment just has a higher chance of reproducing. So just keep in mind that this fitness in nature is like a derived secondary measure. So in the algorithm, we will have a fitness function, like shortest path or whatever. But there's no fitness in the real world, right? Like it's some combination of a whole lot of factors. But it's not always just the strongest gorilla. It's not always the fastest rabbit. But it's probably correlated to those physical abilities or mental abilities that make them able to uh, survive in a particular environment. Sometimes it's just dumb luck. Like you're walking through the woods. Another person is walking through the woods. I find a bunch of food. You don't find a bunch of food. I wasn't necessarily fitter. I just got lucky that day. right? But Luck kind of balances itself out, and traits um, that are more suited for an environment end up winning in the end. So there's going to be some definitions here, but they're not that bad. There's only a couple of definitions. And again, you don't have to necessarily regurgitate them on an exam, but it's nice to know these definitions because they have analogies in the algorithms. So phenotypic traits. Phenotypic traits are the behaviors or physical differences that affect individual responses to the environment. They are partly determined by inheritance, partly by factors during development. So this is nature versus nurture. They are unique to each individual, and they are partly the result of random changes. So the phenotypic traits are like the strength of an individual, right? the speed of an individual, the intelligence of an individual. There's a huge debate that I'm not even going to get into Right? That is, whether or not um, someone's particular fitness or an environment is caused mostly by nature. Right? So you happen to be born, you have a certain set of genetics, or whether it's like what you have learned or trained to do while you are alive. Right? So for example, Michael Jordan, arguably one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century, whether or not you know, being six foot whatever he was and having a hand the, twice the size of mine, or like, does that make him good at basketball? 
It was it genetics, or was it all that hard work that he put into training for basketball, right? It's probably a combination of both. Maybe you take the nature, you multiply it by the nurture, square it, and then there's a log somewhere. You know, it's some function of both of those things. Um, they definitely help. But essentially, each individual is going to have some phenotypic traits that have something to do with how well they survive in an environment. Those traits, at least on Earth, um, with DNA in living things, are inherited in some way. So if phenotypic traits lead to higher chances of reproduction, then those traits have a higher chance to be passed on to offspring, and so to be inherited. So along with some random mutations, like there could be a, no, there are many different ways in which genetic code mutations can occur. Um, one of them, for example, like a solar ray or whatever hits a particular electron, changes part of DNA. You could be bitten by a radioactive spider, right? Uh, when you are actually being born and your cells and DNA are being copied, sometimes there are errors in that copying process. And so these are called mutations, right? So some traits are inherited. You know, if your um, mother or father had a particular trait, it's very likely that you also have that trait. Hair color, height, eye color, skin color, that kind of thing is very, it's very inherited. There are always exceptions, of course, but it's statistically likely that these traits will be inherited. And so along with these random mutations, this leads to new combinations of traits that lead to more fit individuals over time. Of course, there could be a less fit individual, um, but most of the time, over time, we see statistically that these traits lead to higher fitness um, in, a, in an environment. So what this means is that, you know, if you are a gorilla and you're faster or stronger, or both, then that probably means, statistically over time, you have a higher chance of reproduction, right? So your traits being desirable in that environment are going to be passed on. Now, if you take that same individual and, like, if you take me and put me, like, in the Arctic, I'm, I hate that cold, right? I'm not going to be very well survived at that cold. But if you take someone else who's, like, more used to the cold, they're going to survive there, thrive there, be able to fish or hunt or whatever, and get resources that I may not have got. So individuals are only fit with respect to their environment. Right? If you take them out of the desert and put them into the jungle, they may no longer be fit individuals. So it's all within the context of their environment. Like if you take a path, in a pathfinding problem, you want the shortest path, well, this short path is very fit. But if you take that into a new problem, where you may be trying to, I don't know, minimize the, the monetary cost of something, maybe that's no longer a fit individual in that particular environment. So fitness has to do not only with the individual, individual's traits, but also with the environment that they live in. So there's many different um, things involved in the Darwinian evolution process. One of them, well, of course, there are the individuals that we just talked about, but there's also the population. So the population is the set of all of the individuals within a particular location. Typically, we talk about a population of individuals as those individuals which have a chance of reproducing together. Right? So the population, you know, might be of Newfoundland, for example. But if there's like this particular group of insects in Australia and another particular group of insects on the north coast of Newfoundland, they're not typically talked about as being in the same population because they have no chance of intermingling and reproducing. So combinations of traits that are better suited for a given environment lead to a higher chance of reproduction. We just talked about that. And so the individuals are the unit of selection for that environment, right? So you are selected by the environment. Like, the environment doesn't come and, like, hand pick you and say, you get to reproduce. It's kind of the opposite. Via your phenotypic traits in that environment, you have a higher chance of, of reproducing. Variations occurring through random changes yield a constant source of diversity. And coupled with that selection, means that the population is the unit of evolution. So, a very important thing to realize is that the individual does not evolve. Okay? You do not evolve in your lifetime in terms of Darwinian evolution. You are born, you have these genes, you can learn a lot, right? You can change as a person, but like your DNA is not evolving. It's not changing, 
right? What happens is you do particularly well in an environment, someone else does particularly well in an environment, and if you reproduce, the chances are that if two particularly well-suited individuals for an environment reproduce, the traits of this person and the traits of that person combine, and over time and over generations, those traits become stronger and stronger suited for that particular environment. And so the population over time is what evolves, not the individual. So learning during your lifetime is a very different process from evolution through natural selection. All right, so here's some genetics. Warning, again, I'm not a biologist. Um, the information required to build a living organism is coded in the organism's DNA, okay? So we have genetic code in us. For all intents and purposes, think of the environment as the compiler or interpreter of your code, and you have the code inside you, right? If you reproduce with someone else, I'm going to take, like, the first half of assignment one from the mother and the second half of assignment one from the father and just combine that code. Is the resulting code better? It might be. It might not be, right? And so the genotype that's the DNA, that determines the phenotype. So it's very, like, one of, the, one of the definitions that I want you to know is this difference between genotype and phenotype. It's really easy because gene, genome, right, genotype, that's your genes. So the genes are the encoding, like the ACTG of DNA, that would be your actual um, encoding of a thing. That determines whether or not you're fast or strong or smart or whatever. Okay, so that's the phenotype. Genotype is the encoding in DNA, and the phenotype is the realization of that in the environment. And I'll give examples of that later. Genotype to phenotype traits is a very complex mapping. And so scientists have looked at, like, the Human Genome Project, which is going on for a few decades now, and they have identified, hey, so a lot of people who have this property, or a lot of the, whatever organism, humans or not, they have this property, we notice that this gene often appears with this property, right? So it's, it's very difficult to say because we don't have the Python interpreter for DNA code, right? So we can't run the DNA code, but we can find these things that, hey, 100% of the time that we see property X, we see these genes in this spot. And so a whole gigantic field of genetics is dedicated to mapping these genomes, these sequences of your DNA code, to what may be the result of that in the phenotypic traits in that individual. So maybe you have a fly. If it had red eyes instead of blue eyes, we could tell that because in the DNA over here, this is the red eye part and this is the blue eye part. Of course, it's not always that simple, but that's kind of what's going on. So one gene may affect many traits, but many genes may affect one trait as well. So just imagine reading the source code for for a language you don't understand. That's what basically we're looking at with DNA, right? We don't know exactly what's going on, but we are able to like, oh, when this happens, that happens and stuff. So it's, it's very complex, and no one's going to claim they know exactly what's going on. Changes in the genotype may lead to changes in the organism, right? So if you think about your source code for your assignment, there are some parts where if you change that, it may lead to changes in how your code runs. It might be faster. It might be slower. If you start messing with random characters through mutation, let's say there's a bunch of radiation from Chernobyl or whatever, maybe your program crashes, right? Maybe the human is no longer viable. Um, maybe it dies because of the, the radiation changes or whatever. So changes in the genotype may lead to changes in the organism. But if the code that you changed was part of a comment, Right? It's not going to change anything. So sometimes you see changes, and sometimes you don't see changes. So DNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, and its nitrogenous bases. So whenever you see DNA represented, it's like A, T, C, and G. Those are the four letters that they've ascribed to these patterns in DNA. The genes are the functional unit um, of stretches of DNA and uh, on chromosomes. And the complete genetic material in an individual's genotype is called the genome. Human DNA is uh, organized into chromosomes. Human body cells normally, um, statistically more likely, contain uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, which together define the physical attributes of the individual. 
not always the case. There are not always exactly 23, but for the most, the majority of human beings, this is what happens. Um, reproduction. So the gametes, the sperm and egg cells, contain the 23 chromosomes. Um, so each of them contains 23 chromosomes. The gametes are formed by a special form of cell splitting called meiosis. So you undergo meiosis, you split and reproduce. During meiosis, the pairs of chromosomes undergo an operation called crossover. That's very important because it's a part of our algorithm. So you're like, why are you telling us this if it's not on the exam? It's because it, the algorithm kind of actually happens in real life, which is really interesting. And this crossover shares genetic information from both parents to form the offspring. Okay? So you get genetic material from one individual, genetic material from another individual, and they combine to form a new individual. So what happens um, is that you get chromosomes, they, two people, reproduce part of one chromosome and part of another chromosome cross over, like they physically cross over, and part of one goes to another, and so you may get a result looking like this. Okay? So you take part of a path that you had, you know, that was kind of long, you take the last part of that path and you take the first part of the other path and you combine them and see if the new path is shorter than the other path. That's kind of what's going to happen in the, in the algorithm. <clears throat> there are many, many different types of crossover that can happen in different organisms. Here is single crossover, where like you take the first half of one and the second half of the other. That's what we're going to be doing in our assignment. It's very, very simple. Um, but you could have double crossover, where you take different parts of different uh, amounts of genomes. Um, there are very complex ways. Any, basically, any if you think about it in terms of programming, in any way that you could take two arrays and combine their elements, that is a form of crossover. Maybe you could take the odd ones from one array and the odd ones and the even ones from another array and, and combine them that way. That's a form of crossover. But basically, we have some sort of way of taking the genetic material from one and another and combining them to form the genetic material for um, the, the, the child or the, the next offspring. And so you get the sperm cell from the father, the egg cell from the mother, and this produces a new person with a combination of genetic material from both. So all the proteins on Earth are combined of sequences built from these 20 different amino acids. Um, DNA is built from four nucleotides in a double helix spiral, so A, G, T, and C. Um, triplets of these form codons, each of which codes for a specific amino acid, and then the genetic code is the mapping from codons to these amino acids. So we're not going to go into this level of detail. Like I said, this is not going to be on an exam. It's just sort of what happens in the biology. But basically, what I'm trying to say is that the code in the DNA gets run in whatever the universe's you know, compiler is and then spits out uh, an individual with specific traits. And so you get these... Um, for example, fruit flies have been studied a lot. And so, for example, this is just uh, an image which shows, uh, I don't know the exact details, but specific traits of fruit flies have been mapped to specific parts of the genome with a certain probability of this being actually correlated to, to that. Um, also, there have been uh, like facial features in humans that have been correlated with genetic features as well. So, okay. That, that's enough of that, uh, of the biology part. But the last thing I'll talk about is mutation. So occasionally, some of the genetic material changes very slightly during the process of reproduction. Uh, it's caused either by the environment, so something physically damages the DNA, like radiation, for example, or replication error. So the DNA has to be reproduced, and sometimes that process is not exact. This could mean that the child could have genetic material that is not inherited from either parent, right? Like, for example, I am like six inches taller than my mother and my father. Why is that? I don't know. Maybe some gene got changed somewhere. Um, this process of mutation can have one of three different outcomes. It can either be catastrophic, meaning that the offspring is no longer viable, so, of course, you know, you've, you've probably heard of if there was some nuclear disaster somewhere and someone was exposed to radiation to the point where their genes were damaged, that person could die 
or the offspring in future generations, like after atomic bombs, et cetera, they have birth defects, and sometimes they're not, the, the babies can't live because of that. So that's one of the possible things. It's completely catastrophic, so it's just like changing your code. Change a few random characters, and it'll probably crash or not even compile, right? It could be neutral, so the new feature may not influence the fitness at all, or it may be advantageous, right? So maybe that random change in the code led to something um, that's very beneficial. So for example, in a virus, if a virus replicates, there may be some random mutation that makes it so that, um, so let's say we're developing some vaccine or some medication or antibiotics or something against a particular living organism, like either it's a virus or a bacteria or whatever. Um, so what we do is we give people antibiotics, right? And that solves the problem for that person probably within that short time span. Then someone else gets sick, we give them antibiotics. Someone else gets sick, we get them antibiotics. Sometimes it kills all of the bacteria. Sometimes, as the, as the bacteria are reproducing, some of them undergo a change that makes them resistant to that antibiotic. Right? So if 99.9% .9 of them die, but 1% of them lives, the 1% who lived is now more resistant to that antibiotic, because they had to be in order to survive. And so if those 1% all start reproducing, well, each of the 1%, by definition, are more resistant to that antibiotic, because that's how they survived. So now the next generation is all has a high probability of be, being resistant to that antibiotic. Right? And we have seen this, like experiments have been done over decades where they take viruses and bacteria and you know, they introduce something that's supposed to kill them and then maybe in experiment 400, a few survive. Right? They have some gene that lets them survive and then those go on to reproduce and now you have this like, super bacteria which is resistant to everything that we have. So if a doctor is like, reluctant to give out antibiotics if you don't really need it, that's why. Because by giving antibiotics, we're solving the problem for you, but long term, we are creating more and more resistant things to antibiotics. It's like this weird catch-22 situation. So some important uh, individ or evolution notes. Individuals do not intentionally change themselves to suit an environment. There is no learning involved in that process. So again, there are two separate processes. There is evolution and there is learning. For example, if you stuck me in the jungle, I might be able to learn how to hunt or fish or make a shelter or survive. I don't know how to do that right now, but I would like fiddle with some things, maybe I meet somebody, I could learn to survive in that environment. That is a different thing from me being genetically changed by my mother and father and possibly some random mutations and then being naturally better suited for that environment. So again, it's better to look at these things in terms of like simpler organisms than humans sometimes. But like the tiger didn't decide I should grow really strong and have really sharp teeth because it knew that that would be better for hunting. No. It's that the organisms who over the course of millions of years of evolution, for whatever reason, became stronger, right? They were more likely to catch prey, to find a mate, to reproduce. Their offspring became stronger. The offspring of those offsprings who had maybe some random mutations to become even stronger, they reproduced, they fought off their, their enemies even better, right? And so the traits that became, that became, sorry, the end result of the tiger being super fast and super strong were the result of this process, not, the pro not like the tiger going to the gym and like, you know, just becoming stronger. It's, it, it was this process. And the thing is, the, in the fit individuals for the environment, they get to reproduce. They're not like, okay, hand chosen 100% of the time, but it's more likely that the stronger tiger gets the kill, gets the food, and survives to reproduce, statistically speaking. The good traits of the parents are passed to offspring, producing individuals fitter than either parent. Not always, sometimes the bad traits also go, right? So if you, for example, if you had a parent with one, like the left leg genetically mutated to be not so good, and the other parent had the right leg mutated to be not so good, 
Maybe those two parents have a child with two legs that aren't so good, right? It's not always the case that only the good things are passed on. But because of natural selection, the fitter individuals reproduce more often, and so statistically, the fitness does go up. And random, individual, random mutations can introduce new traits, and this process produces more fit populations. And typically, evolution takes so long that we don't get to see it in our lifetime. And, and this problem, not a problem, but this fact of evolution where it takes so long that like a single human being can't observe it, you know, it's part of the reason why there are people who do not trust the process of evolution or don't believe that this process goes on. But we have observed evolution happen in our lifetimes. And so here's an example. Has anyone heard of the peppered moth example, maybe in a biology class or anything? A couple hands up. OK. So what happened was there was this peppered moth. It's this like beige white colored moth. And it had a few brown speckles, right? And what happened was this moth lived on these trees, which had a bark, which was a very similar color to the, to the peppered moth. So for hundreds or thousands or however many years, um, in, and this was in England, this particular example, peppered moth had great camouflage, right? So birds love to eat this moth, big old juicy moth. I want to eat a moth. I've got to be able to see the moth in order to eat the moth. So it would perch on the tree. It would be relatively camouflaged. It would go undetected by the birds. OK. So moths, you know, they have some genetic code. Part of their genetic code is the color of their wings, for example. So every now and then, two white speckled moths would get together, have a baby. Usually, that baby would be about the same color. But sometimes, maybe one of them would come out darker. OK. That darker colored offspring if they landed on the lightly colored tree, would just stand out. And so in that case, for that period of evolution, in that environment with lightly colored trees, any dark colored moths would just get picked off by the birds. And because they were getting eaten by birds, they wouldn't live long enough to reproduce. And so that means that that trait of that particular individual would not be selected for reproduction. And so it would be very unlikely that future generations would take on that same trait. But then the Industrial Revolution happened. Humans came along and started pouring ungodly amounts of smoke into the environment, especially in Britain, where the Industrial Revolution was really born. And what happened was this soot from the smoke and the pollution got on the trees, and the trees turned dark. And what you have now is that the trees are dark, and the normally lightly colored peppered moth for the last, you know, however many centuries, is now standing out on the bark. And so if they have an offspring that is now darker in color, that darker colored offspring now stands out less on this newly, freshly uh, darker colored bark. And so the offspring, which are now darker colored, they, they are now living longer. Right? So if they are living longer, the environment chooses them to reproduce more readily. And so their traits are now being passed on. And because their traits are to be a darker color, their offspring were more likely to be a darker color. And through, over the course, I, I think it was like 40 to 80 years or something like that. It was just like every generation, they were seeing differences and differences and differences. Eventually, the peppered moth changed from being this lighter color to a darker color, but that was not a learned thing. This is the difference between learning and evolution, right? They didn't say, oh, wow, all that smoke is turning the trees dark. Therefore, I'm going to change my wing color. They can't do that. They don't have that physical ability. But those that were lighter ended up dying off, and those that were darker colored ended up reproducing more, and so the population tended toward this. And if the, you know, maybe if the Industrial Revolution ended and the new trees uh, became lighter, the process would happen in reverse again. Okay? Not saying it's, it's guaranteed, but this was observed in a lifetime by human beings. OK, so that, that's the example there um, that, that I really like to give. So some of the motivation for evolutionary computing is that nature, um, 
nature's always served as inspiration for engineers and scientists, right? Like we have a number of algorithms like ant colony optimization, evolutionary computation, genetic algorithms, genetic programming, lots of things that are inspired by, um, by biology. Developing a new problem um, solving method, like a new algorithm, is a central theme in math and computer science. And the complexity, as we get more data and we get harder problems, the complexity of these problems that we need to solve increases. And so more and more robust problem solving technology is required. And it turns out that evolution has been a solution for very complex problems in the natural environment. So why don't we try it in an artificial environment? So problems are too complex for uh, these existing solutions that we have. And so maybe use evolution as a problem solving method in computer science. So evolutionary computation can simulate evolutionary processes with millions of generations. The problem with evolution in real life is that it requires someone live, like being born, living, reproducing, and dying. Right? That's the problem with evolution, is that it takes so long. But in a computer, if we can accurately simulate the environment in which we're doing the natural selection, we can do millions of generations per second and get a really cool um, output pretty quickly. If we can model the, the, the problem in terms of environments, individuals, and fitnesses, then it's very likely that evolutionary computation can provide solutions. So let's take an example of this. And this was actually, um, I did this for, I think it was my honors project. I did computer science here. And I did a problem um, very much like this. So let's take the problem of exam scheduling at MUN. Right? So let's say you're the person involved in scheduling the exams. Now it turns out most of this is done by hand. And like we had, there's a solution that kind of works. Courses really don't change that much over time. And so they just have like a decent exam schedule that they do that they keep and modify a little bit. But let's say I just gave you all the professors, all the students, all the rooms, all the courses, and all the time slots and say algorithmically, give me a solution to that. Well. You've learned a search algorithm. You could probably do heuristic search for that. right? You could think about it. Like, what are some of the constraints that I have to satisfy? Well, students and professors can't have more than one exam at a time. Like, You can't be in the same uh, two different rooms at once. No room can have more than one exam in it at a time. Well, maybe, OK, if you had a big gym, you could have four or five different classes in there. And a student shouldn't have more than three exams in a day. right? That's, that's, a, that's a particular constraint. So if we tried to combine, if you take all the profs times all the students times all the rooms times all the courses times all the time slots, it's, that number is so big, you don't have a chance at exhaustively searching the space. Right? Now you're thinking, OK, well, maybe we apply some heuristics to it. Well, the heuristics for this are very difficult. How do you, like, I can have a heuristic for what direction I should head in for the garbage can, right? like assignment two. But how do I have a heuristic? For whether or not this schedule, like how do I know if I'm going in the right direction with changing this schedule? It's very difficult. It is a gigantic search space. And the majority isn't, a, isn't even valid. So instead of applying this exhaustive search, you could do a genetic algorithm. And that's what we did. So we applied, we took, we got the MUN course data um, from the university, and we wrote a genetic algorithm. And it was able to do a decent job of, of scheduling the courses. Because in these extremely complex environments, the, the place you want to use evolutionary computation is an extremely complex task. Um, you'll get very close to an optimal solution very quickly. But it's unlikely that you'll get to the optimal solution. Okay, so you'll evolve very quickly over time. But if there's a single individual that is the most fit it's very difficult to get to that. And, and I'll show you why in a bit. OK, HDMI, what are you doing? All right. So the evolutionary computation metaphor is that populations of individuals exist in an environment with limited resources. Competition for these resources cause selections of fitter individuals that have better adapted to that environment. These individuals reprodu reproduce to form a new generation of individuals through recombination and mutation. New individuals have fitnesses evaluated. Higher fitnesses individuals are chosen to reproduce and pass on, hopefully, their good traits to new um, offspring. 
And over time, this natural selection or unnatural selection in the case of like an algorithm causes this fitness to rise. So what happens is we have a population. That population is represented somehow. So the genotype, which is the gene of the individual, is represented somehow. Maybe it's an array of values or something like that. We have a population. Each of those individuals in the population is evaluated. So for example, it could be the length of the path or the, how close you are to a Sudoku solution. Um, so that's an, a fitness function. Then we are going to have some way of saying, let's say my population is four things. If two of them have a population or a fitness of 100 and two of them have a fitness of 20, what is the algorithm that I'll use to select which of those individuals I'm going to use to reproduce? So maybe, for example, you could say, well, I'm going to take the highest valued one every time. Or you could do something like, um, I'm going to have it be a chance to be selected based on its fitness. Right? So based on the fitness values that you've assigned to it, uh, you do reproduction. Reproduction is saying, here is one parent, here is another parent. You could have more than two parents in this if you wanted to, if, that's, if you try it and it's beneficial. You cross over the genotypes from the parents, and then you mutate it, and then you have a new individual, and that new individual goes into the next generation's population. So this is the algorithm that closely resembles real evolution that we can actually implement in code. So here is the pseudocode for evolution, at least in evolutionary algorithms. First, initialize the population with individuals. Perhaps they are random individuals. So we don't know a solution yet, so let's just choose random values. Let's choose random paths or random numbers for Sudoku. So our first population is going to be randomized. Then we're going to repeat the evolutionary process until some termination condition. There could be many different termination conditions. For example, you could have um, an amount of generations that you want to run for. More typically, you'll have a time limit, like I want to run this for an hour or a day or a month or something like that. Maybe you've got uh, Amazon credits, right, that you, you, you got 100 bucks to spend on this problem. Maybe you want to run it until the fitness is no longer improving. Or if you know that the problem has a solution, then run until we get the solution, right? So there's many different termination conditions here. You choose that based on the problem that you're trying to solve. So the first thing you do is you take the population and you evaluate it. So you determine the individual fitnesses for that population. Then, based on those numbers, you select parents. And typically, you are going to somehow prefer to select higher fitness individuals to be parents. Then you combine the parents to form offspring. Then you mutate the resulting offspring with some probability. Maybe 1% of offspring get mutated. Maybe 50% of offspring get mutated. And then those offspring become the next population, and this whole cycle repeats. So the pseudocode for this is pretty intuitive, and it's pretty simple. There are, back to the question that I got at the beginning of class, whoever, uh, whoever asked this, I can't remember, but the different types of evolutionary algorithm, um, they have essentially, there are many different algorithms within evolutionary computation. Those algorithms only differ in how they represent candidate solution individuals. So for example, if you do an evolutionary algorithm and you represent your individuals with a binary string or an integer string, so your gene that you're using is just integers, that's called a genetic algorithm. So that's what a genetic algorithm is. It's not different than evolutionary algorithm. It is a type of evolutionary algorithm in which you are using integers for your genotype. If you have real values, then that is called an evolutionary strategy. Sorry, that's supposed to be evolutionary strategy. If you use finite state machines for your representation, that's called evolutionary programming. And if you have a tree structure for your genotype, that is called genetic programming. Okay, so you can think of a tree structure as, uh, I'll give an example of that um, maybe next time. So, the differences between different types of evolutionary algorithm are largely cosmetic, right? The pseudocode for the base evolutionary algorithm part, the thing that we just showed, this is the high-level code for every type of evolutionary algorithm. 
Now, each type of evolutionary algorithm, genetic algorithm, genetic programming, for example, um, the way that you mutate a genetic algorithm is going to be different from how you mutate in genetic programming, right? Because in a genetic algorithm, a mutation might be change this 9 to a 7, or change every odd number, move it up by 1, or whatever. Whatever you come up with for mutation of just a changing one number to another number. But for a tree structure for the genotype, you've got to, you've got to mutate it in a different way. So you could think, for example, um, take this subtree and swap this subtree with this subtree from the other one, right? Or change this subtree, maybe delete that subtree from your code. <coughs> and so, yes, there are differences because, but they're all caused by the different representation. So the main components of an evolutionary algorithm, um, so while the biology did not need to be on an exam, um, this, this is a good question for an exam. Like, what's the overall pseudocode for an evolutionary algorithm, right? Um, what are, you know, what representation, if, you, if I give you real valued vectors, what that, what's that called? What type of algorithm is that? So everything computer science related could be on an exam. So the main components are the representation, so that's the definition of the individual, the evaluation or fitness function, how you actually evaluate something to be selected, the population, so am I going to start with a population of 1,000 individuals, 10 individuals, a million individuals? What is the shape of that population? Is it a 1D array, a 2D array, whatever? Um, what is the parent selection mechanism? So once I've evaluated everything, how do I actually choose it? There are variation operators, so how do I do recombination? Is it maybe the first half of one, the second half of another? Am I taking the odds and evens and combing them? Um, how do I do mutation, et cetera, et cetera? What is the survivor selection mechanism? So maybe um, things over a certain fitness should, have, like, should get to reproduce for free sort of thing, or maybe they just get copied into the next generation. Here's one of the annoying things about implementing a genetic algorithm. All of these things are basically parameterized, right? So you could think of five or six different ways to do all of these. <clears throat> so on assignment four, where you're actually going to implement a genetic algorithm, I've basically chosen one way of doing each of these things, and I tell you the exact way, and you're just going to implement that way. But just know that you could have done all of those things in many, many different ways, and you are free to actually optimize things to try and get a better solution if you're able to um, on the assignment. But I'm not going to say, OK, you know, go out and research all the different variation operators and then choose one for the assignment. No, it's enough work just to program what I've showed you. So those representations. Um, candidate solutions, individuals, exist in the phenotypic space. So just realize that the phenotype is the actual solution candidate. So if we're doing a pathfinding problem, the phenotype is the actual path itself. They are encoded in chromosomes, which exist in the genotypic space. So the genotype is the representation of the phenotype. And so encoding goes from phenotype, the real thing, to the genotype. And decoding goes from the genotype to the phenotype. And typically in a genetic algorithm, not necessarily in real life, but in a GA or another type of evolutionary algorithm, you want this process to be one-to-one. -one. You want it to be reversible. You want to be able to get from the genotype to the phenotype and vice versa. In order to find a global optimum, every possible solution must be representable in the genotype space. What does this mean? It means that you can kind of think of this almost like a hash function. Right, where I'm taking an actual solution and encoding it somehow. But if you want to be able to find the optimal solution, you have to ensure that if there is a best possible phenotype, that that is somehow representable in whatever your genotypic representation is. Okay? So here's an example where this all really gets driven home. Who here has played Sudoku or at least heard of Sudoku or knows the rules? Okay? So in Sudoku, most of the hands were up. You get this 9 by 9 board. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to place numbers on the grid such that in each row and each column and each 3 by 3 square, the numbers 1 through 9 appear exactly once. Okay? So it's a puzzle game. 
And the Sudoku board itself, that is the phenotype. The phenotype is the actual representation of the thing that we can apply a fitness to, right? The genotype is the representation of the Sudoku board that we will use for our genetic algorithm, okay? So in this case, what I've done is just start in the top left, put the five down, then put the three down, then the zero, then the zero, then seven, then zeros are blanks. And so I go across the first row, go across the second row, go across the third row until I get to zero, seven, nine at the end. So this phenotype to genotype mapping, that is called encoding. So I encode the phenotype into the genotype. And then the genetic algorithm that we're going to implement is going to be based on this. We're not going to worry about this. We are actually using the genotype to do um, the, the genetic algorithm, right? So how do we form a population of random individuals for this? Well, we have a big array of size 81 that we assign random integers to. How do we select parents? Well, we apply a fitness function and we select parents that way. Then how do we do crossover? Well, maybe we take the first half of parent one's array and the second half of parent two's array and form a new array with those values, right? And so that's, what, that's why we have this genotype. Next, we have um, the evaluation or fitness function. This represents an estimate of how well an individual will perform in a given environment, so how fit they are to reproduce. This, is, this assigns a real valued fitness to each phenotype which forms the basis for selection. So the idea here is that more fine-grained different values, the better. So for example, you would want to be able to assign, um, you know, if this is going to lead us to a better solution, we want it to have a higher value. You don't want to just give everything that's not a solution zero and everything that is a solution a one. You would want values in between to indicate maybe this is closer to a solution than another thing. And usually, in GAs, we talk about fitness as being maximized. Okay, so we want to maximize the fitness. So here's an example fitness function that I did years ago for Sudoku. It is not what you have to do for the assignment, but it's just an example fitness function. So over here, this is a uh, Sudoku board with, let's say it's just randomized, right? So I put random numbers on there. Probably not going to be a solved Sudoku board. So what I've done is for each row and for each, so for each row and for each column, the red numbers in red here, this is the number of unique numbers in that row. So there's an eight, a nine, a six, a two, a four, and a one. So in that row, there are six. In order for this to be a true Sudoku, that would have to be a nine for every row and for every column, right? Because it would have to be all unique. And also, I do it over here um, for each of these three by three squares as well. So if you are looking at what is the maximal possible fitness for something like this, well, it will be 9 times 9 plus 9 times 9 plus 9 times 9, right? So it would be 81 times 3, 243 or something, I think. So the maximum possible fitness for this Sudoku board is 243. And so that's an example of a fitness function. Now, if we are doing something, like say, okay, something with a, and I'll, I'll get to that when I get to another slide. Here's another example of a fitness function. So this is like building a skeletal structure. We don't have like a really big fancy physics simulator in this class for, for doing genetic algorithms. But in this case, they have evolved the structure of, of a GA um, to represent like the skeleton and walking gait for this whatever this giraffe or whatever it is. And over time, you know, we have a fitness and that fitness is how far has that thing been able to move, been able to walk. So if in the first generation, you know, you just have everything falling down, maybe in the second generation you have something moving a couple of steps. So the thing that moved a couple of steps gets chosen to reproduce more likely than the thing that fell down. So whatever made it walk a few more steps is going to reproduce, and those traits will go on and on, and some of them will get mutated, and eventually we get something that can actually walk. That's the hope, anyway. Um, the population holds the representation of possible solutions. 
It usually has a fixed size, so we're going to stick with 500 things here. Um, some sophisticated evolutionary algorithms have a special structure on the population. We're not going to worry about that for our assignment. Selection operators usually take the whole population into account, so we look at everything in the population to choose the parents. And the diversity of a population represents the number of di different fitnesses, phenotypes, or genotypes in the population. So what this graph shows, and I'll get into this a bit more, you'll understand this more with the assignment. This is the running of a genetic algorithm for the Sudoku assignment, for assignment four. In green, this is the minimum fitness in a given population. So if we're inserting random things, it's going to have a low fitness. This is the maximum fitness, which you can see going up over time. And here, the black line, which goes up and down, that is the average fitness. So there's a good spread here, right? You have some really fit, really fit candidates. You have some really unfit candidates. And, but in general, like, you have something in between. That's a pretty diverse um, population. If you have something like this, this is a very non-diverse population, right? You have kind of things that are looking very similar, all just reproducing with themselves. And that works well for a time, but it doesn't have the genetic diversity that you need to escape a possible hole that you fell into in your evolution, right? So this is less diversity. And we'll go more into that when we introduce the assignment. Parent selection mechanism. We are going to assign variable probabilities of individuals as parents depending on their fitness. It's usually probabilistic, so this means that higher quality solutions are more likely to reproduce, but it's not guaranteed. And typically, we want every solution, every individual in the population has some chance of reproducing, even if it's close to zero. And what happens is this stochastic nature helps escape local, local optima, and I'll show what that means in a little bit. So here's the algorithm that we're going to be using for our um, assignment. It's called roulette wheel selection. Roulette wheel selection is exactly what it sounds like. Take the fitness of every individual and plot it on a wheel. Okay, It's like a pie chart. So if this individual, let's say that has, you know, let's just say our total um, fitness is 100 or something like that. So this one has 31% uh, of the total fitness. This one has 5% of the total fitness, 38%, 12%, 14%. And you can think of this as now we just take it and we spin the wheel. And whichever one is on top, when it stops, that one gets to reproduce. Okay? Or you take a dart and you throw the dart, and wherever the dart lands randomly is going to be the thing that reproduces. So a linear relationship between your fitness and your chance to reproduce. Here's what that algorithm looks like. And I'm actually going to do out this example um, because it's, I think it's important. So let's say we have a fitness, or a population. And I'm drawing really poorly because I'm bad with the mouse. But this is an array of a few things. OK. <clears throat> so this pop fitness, that is this array over here, where everything in our population gets assigned to fitness. So let's say I have 6, 10, uh, 4, 30, uh, 1, 4, and 10 again. So those are the fitnesses of everything in my population. So that's like the pie chart. That's the wheel that we're going to spin. The algorithm says, take the sum of everything in that array. Anyone want to sum that up for me? 20, 50, 1, 55, 65, I think. So 65 is the sum. So here for this one, this will be 65. And then we're going to pick a random number between 0 and 65. OK, so let's just take 40. I'm just going to take 40. I pick that randomly out of my head. Now I'm going to have a number which is called current. And that number is currently 0. OK, so it's 0. I'm sticking it up there. Oh, if you're watching this video, part of this is going to be occluded by my face. So apologies for that. Good reason to come to class. Um, so you probably don't see that. So I'm going to move this over here. Hopefully you can see this. So we have a 0 and a 6. So what this says is, for everything in the population, go from the first thing down, from the la down to the last thing, and then add that fitness to this current variable. And if that current variable is now greater than the random number that I chose, then that is the thing I am selecting for a parent. Very simple algorithm. 
So what we do here is the first number was 6, so we add 6, our current total is 6. Is 6 greater than 40? No. So I go to the next thing. I add 10. Now I'm at 16. 16 greater than 40? No. Go to the next thing. Add 4, because it's a 4. It's 20. Is 20 greater than 40? No. Go to the next thing. It's a 30. Add 30. Now we're at 50. Is 50 greater than 40? Yes. So that one was chosen in this iteration to be the parent, okay, or one of the parents. And you can see how it has a better chance of being selected if it's a bigger number. Linear relationship. It'll be very unlikely for us to land on that one, right? Because the, the number would have had to be uh, 51, like exactly, in order for that thing to be chosen as a parent. So that's the algorithm. Pretty simple algorithm. You'll be implementing that algorithm on the assignment. Variation operators. So, so the role is to generate new candidate solutions from parents to offspring, usually divided into two types according to the number of inputs. Um, the first type of variation operator is called a mutation operator. It just has one input, and we change something about it. The other one is called a recombination operator, which has greater than one input. And if it has exactly two inputs for our assignment, that is called crossover. So most evolutionary algorithms use both recombination and mutation. Here is an example of crossover. So if we have one array right here, let's say this is one Sudoku board, and we have another Sudoku board, and these were chosen as the parents, we're just going to take the first half of one and the second half of the other and form two new offspring based on that. We literally cross it over. That's what it's called. Mutation, on the other hand, can have different forms. We could think of uh, a mutation as maybe swapping two things in the genome. So we take two things on the, on the Sudoku board and swap them. Maybe that's a good thing to do. Maybe it's not a good thing to do. In some cases, it would be really bad. In some cases, it might be really good. Another way is to just take a random number and change it by a little bit. So I can't remember which one we're going to do on the assignment, but we'll, ta we'll talk about that next time. So again, there are many ways that we could have done crossover, but we're not doing this way. We're just doing the very simple um, go up to an index, take that part, and put it in the second part of another one. Next is uh, survivor selection. It's also called uh, environmental selection. Most evolutionary algorithms use a fixed population size and need a way of going from parents and offspring to a next generation. And this survivor se uh, selection is often deterministic. So, for example, it might be a really good idea to keep your fittest, maybe top 2% of individuals to just copy them to the next generation to ensure that your current best stuff is always staying around. Because there is a chance that if it's not if it's not guaranteed that your fittest individuals reproduce, that they could die off and then your fitness actually starts to go down. So sometimes you just want to take really fitness fit individuals and just like cheat and copy them into the next generation. So that's just one of the things we'll be doing on the assignment is you take the top X percent of your individuals and they just get carried over to the next generation for free. Initialization and term, term, uh, termination. So the initialization is going to be done randomly. Um, and so you're going to ensure an even mixture of these random candidates, and this is, can include existing solutions or heuristics. We're just going to do random. And the termination condition is going to be we reach some desired fitness or a generation limit or a time limit, whatever. Our solution is actually just going to run, and we're going to graph it. So we won't have an actual termination condition for the assignment, other than if you have solved the Sudoku, then you can stop. So... What we see, the typical behavior of an evolutionary algorithm, is let's say this line represents our solution space. Okay? So if you take all possible Sudoku solutions, for example, and you plot them across the x-axis. So the x-axis here, that is every possible Sudoku um, possible solution. So all the possible random numbers. Some of these have a low fitness. Some of these have a high fitness. Right? As we run our genetic algorithm, our individuals, ideally, are going to tend to go toward these areas of high fitness, hopefully. But Sudoku is a really good example of what we call a local optima. Let's say 
that we have a Sudoku board that is really close to being solved. We're like two numbers off, right? So in Sudoku, here, the whole board is all nines. It's all looking good, except we have two ones in this column and two threes in this column. So fitness-wise, it's very close to being solved, right? But if you've ever played Sudoku, you know that this may actually be nowhere near being solved. Because if you take this three, and so what's missing from this column, right? Uh, a one is missing from this column. So you might say, change this. All I got to do is change this three to a one. Oh, crap, there's a one here. So that doesn't solve my problem. Maybe I'll change this three to a one. Oh, crap, there's a one here. Right? So I can't just change that one thing. So this is a local optima. We are probably like right here, but the global optima is somewhere over here. And we just missed it. So these solutions may have started right here or right here, and then our genetic algorithm guided them to be right here. But it's going to take a big change for us to go from this local optima to this other better local optima. And the only way that we can do that in a GA is through the random mutations. So every generation, what we're going to do is we're going to insert maybe 10% of the population as completely random. That way, there's always a diverse genetic pool to be able to say, OK, maybe one really fit parent uh, uh, combined with this really random parent, and we got lucky, and that jumped this gap to over to the, the next local optima. Okay? Because the genetic algorithm doesn't let us just slowly go down, because that would be the fitness going down. So if we do get stuck in a local optima, we need to get um, over here. Now, there are some problems that are not like Sudoku. Okay? There are some problems that kind of look like this, where there is only one optima. So let's take an example where, let's say, all we wanted to do was find the biggest sum of all the values in that grid. Right? So let's say we had, by the end, mostly nines, but a few eights. All we would have to do is eventually mutate those eights into nines, and we'd be done. There's not this, like, every, sol every possible solution in that case of just summing everything can eventually lead to this global optima. That's called a convex optimization problem. If problems are convex, because they have that convex shape, then there's a many different ways that we can solve that problem, including genetic algorithms, but like there's, there's gradient descent, all sorts of things. Convex problems are almost trivial to solve, because you can always go up, and you'll eventually get to the optimal problem. But real-world interesting problems are not convex. They have local optima that we can get stuck in, and so genetic variation is very important Mutation is very important for getting out of those um, phenomena. OK. So what we'll see is, in a typical genetic algorithm run, you make a ton of progress really, really quickly. But then we start to plateau. OK. And what you may see is, if you then reach some like lucky recombination, maybe you know, eventually you see another spike where it gets out of one low.